I asked for the wireless because I hate podiums. I just can't stand them. It makes me very, very nervous. But um, uh, first, I looked at how much time I had, and I had 45 minutes, and I'm so verbose. It takes me 45 minutes to get into any topic. So I thought I'd pick something very specific. Uh, I thought I'd talk about deferred taxes for 45 minutes. <laughs> if you think I'm serious, you're sick. I mean, I, there's no way I'm talking about deferred taxes for 45 seconds. Okay. But basically, 45 minutes is not enough time to actually talk about any specific detail in valuation. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to talk about what I think makes valuations go bad. When I talk about the dark side of valuation, I'm talking about bad valuations. And let's face it, there are two things that are true about valuation. First, most people who claim to do valuation are not doing valuation. They're doing pricing. I mean, let me be very specific about what I mean. Let's say you decide to buy an apartment or a house. You hire a realtor, right? The realtor shows you the apartment, then she gives you a number, or he gives you a number. I don't be sexist about this. And says, this apartment is worth 10 million. Ask yourself a question. How did the realtor come up with the number? Did he or she value the apartment, or did he or she price the apartment? The answer is, he or she priced the apartment, right? They looked at other apartments in the neighborhood. They looked at what they sold for and said, that's what the value of your apartment is. You think that's real estate. They're not sophisticated there. Pick up an equity research report. What do you see? You see a company. You see a multiple. You see comparables. This company is cheap or expensive given how these other 15 companies are trading at. And let's face it, the realtor is actually on more solid ground talking about comparables than most equity research analysts are because there is no other company out there that's similar to the company you're being valued. So you kind of throw up your hands and you tell it a few stories and say, those can't trust me. Those 15 companies are just like your company. So much of what passes for valuation out there is pricing. So often when we talk about valuation challenges, you're talking about pricing challenges. And I understand your job is to price assets. I'm not picking on you for doing that, but don't tell me you're doing valuation. But when people actually do valuation, they do a pretty good job, right? There are all these books out there on valuation. You've taken all these classes on valuation. We have all these models on valuation, all this data that feeds into valuation. You think that the state of the art of valuation must be getting better. But it's not. You see some incredibly screwed up valuations. And the question is why? What, what can we do to fix it? So remember about a couple of years ago, the uh, head of M&A, the major investment bank in New York, asked me to come and talk to his bankers. And I said, what, what do you want me to talk to them? They've heard enough from me already. They said, we'd like you to talk about valuation to them, because I, they're, they're doing some really bad stuff in valuation. <laughs> and I said, it's pointless. Nothing I say is going to change. Because it's not that they don't know how to do valuation. It's that they're in a process where screwed up valuations are going to feed out of the process. If the process is screwed up, the valuations are going to be screwed up as well. So what I'd like to talk about today is the process of valuation. What I think of is the three demons that cause bad valuations. And none of them have to do with metrics and models. In fact, I was thinking about um, sexy title for this. I, I've discovered that sexy titles are the biggest part of selling books and selling presentations. And I thought the Bermuda Triangle is a good way to describe this. Hey, you, you've heard of the Bermuda Triangle, right? Ships would go there, or planes would fly in there and just disappear. This is where valuations go to die. <laughs> and here are the three sides of the triangle. There's the bias side. The biggest enemy of good valuation is bias. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. The second is uncertainty. As human beings, we're terrible at dealing with uncertainty. We prefer to deny that it exists, push it behind the curtain. What uncertainty? I don't see it out there. And the third is complexity. Complexity in the sense we have all this data and we can build all these big models. And after a while, we lose sight of what we're trying to do. Bias, uncertainty, and complexity. So let me start with the first of the sides of those triangles, which is bias. We'd like to think that valuation is an exercise in analysis. You're trying to value the company and come up with a number. I wish it were true. Because here's what I tend to see. I tend to see people think of a number first and then come up with the valuation to back up the number they already have. It's backwards, right? 
it's, uh, it reminds me of Alice in Wonderland. Remember when Alice wanders into the Queen's court and the Queen says, verdict first, trial afterwards, which might not be such a bad idea given some of the trials we've seen. But that seems to be the state of the art in valuation. Value comes first, valuation to follow. So that's the first, first thing when you talk about bias, it's value first. The second is you almost never sit down to value a company with a blank slate. In other words, you already have preconceptions about companies. In fact, my valuation class, how many of you have, been, have taken my valuation class? Okay. Remember you had to pick a company early in the semester? Okay. One semester I tried a little experiment. The day people picked a company, I said, before you start off valuing the company, why don't you tell me with the company name whether you think you're going to find this company to be undervalued or overvalued? They complained. They said, but we haven't done the valuation yet. I said, just give me your gut feeling. And they were pretty good about it. So I got the spreadsheet together of companies they'd picked and their priors, what they thought they were going to find. And then they turned in their projects at the end of the 15th week. And I did a correlation <laughs> between what they thought they were going to find and what they found. And here's a miracle. <laughs> Most of them found what they thought they would find. Okay? It, it's, I think, something we don't think through, but it's there. And here are some of the, I think, the, the ironies in valuation. When you, when, you, when you sit down to value a company, what are you told? Read up as much as you can about the company. Find out more about the company. That's good, right? But there's a dark side to that. The more you know about a company, the more biases you have about the company. Some of my easiest valuations have been of companies I don't know anything about. In fact, when I go into a market often, I pick it last, last year or two years ago. I had to go to Slovenia, do a presentation on valuation. I picked Slovenia because my wife's grandparents came from Slovenia. I wanted to see the country. I realized it was a little cantonment. You could drive through it in 20 minutes. Right? <laughs> so I had to pick a Slovenian company. And I'm sure you probably are aware of major Slovenian companies, but I knew of none. So I actually went to Bloomberg. I picked a list of Slovenian companies. I closed my eyes. I pointed to the screen, and I picked a company, a company called Kirka. Never heard of it before. I didn't even know what they did. One of the cleanest valuations I've ever done. Because I, no, I had no biases. I could sit there with the numbers, look at what they did, and draw a judgment on the valuation. About eight months ago, I put a post up on Apple. And some of you might have read this. But I made a confession. I said, I've never been able to value Apple as a company. Because I'm too biased. I love the company. And I know I love the company, and it's going to show, it's going to find its way into the numbers. The more you know about a company, the more difficult it becomes for you to put distance between you and the company. And if you get to know the managers of the company, God help you. <laughs> you play golf with the CEO, don't even show me your valuation. I am not interested. You've got to maintain enough distance to be objective, and that's not easy to do. So let's talk about the sources of bias. Okay. So if you think about where this bias comes from, some of it is behavioral, right? Which is, you don't even know where it comes from. Sometimes look at a company, I really like this company. Why? Is, I like the name of the company. Okay. So some of it, you just don't even know where it comes from. Some of it, you can trace back. If everybody else is saying good things about a company, it's kind of difficult for you to step back and be objective and say bad things about that company. There's a herd behavior mentality. In fact, let me use my, my, my class again to illustrate a concept. Many people who take my class, this is the first time they've done a full valuation of a company. And when you value a company and you come up with a value, what's the first thing you check it against? The market price, right? And if your value is different from the market price, what's your second instinct? Especially if you've never done valuation before, which is, I must have done something wrong. Let me go revisit my valuation. Valuations magically move towards the market price. And the more, and the, and the less confidence you have in this process, the more likely it is that is to happen. And it's actually, it makes sense, because if you think about it, if you're going to screw up, it's always good to have lots of company, right? And being at the market price basically means, hey, I screwed up, but so did everybody else. <laughs> That's a herd behavior. The other is hindsight bias. I have never, ever used a case an evaluation class. It's pointless. And here's why. If you use a case, it's set back in time, right? 
So I ask you to value AOL for Time Warner in 1999. You know what you're going to find? Time Warner paid too much for AOL. Surprise! <laughs> and you know why you find it? Because you know what happened after 99. But I tell you, when I give you the case, act like you're in 1999. What universe is that going to be on? It's impossible to take out hindsight bias from this process. If you're going to do valuation, it has to be with real companies in real time. Because once you know the outcome, all is lost. So that's the first source of bias. The second is what I call the power of suggestion. I, I remember talking to a managing director about, he, he was in charge of an IPO team, did valuations. And I said, no, and he was complaining about the fact that these IPO valuations didn't always seem to come back with, with numbers that he knew already off the top. And he said, well, why, why am I using these guys? They always, and I said, what do you do? And he said, I usually give them the company and I give them a rough sense of what I think the company is worth. And then I ask them to do the valuation. So basically, he's in the company and says, this is an IPO. I think it's worth about $15 per share, but do the valuation anyway. Okay? And not surprising, they finish the valuation and what comes back? $15 per share. You can, it's very easy to throw in subtle ways of pushing numbers. So when I give you a company, and in fact, I tried this experiment once. I actually gave two groups, I was teaching two valuation sessions, must have been torturing myself that semester. Okay? And I gave them the same company to value for an IPO. And in one class, at the time that I gave them the numbers, I gave them a little subtle hint. I said, well, I think, you know, the, the, the $4 per share is, is what people thought it was worth, but ignore that I said that. And then I showed them the distribution of valuations in each class, and magically the $4 became the middle of the distribution, the class where I threw it in. But here's the biggest source of bias. You tell me who pays you and how much you get paid for doing a valuation. I'll tell you which direction the bias is and how much the bias is. One of the first rules in valuation, right? Who pays you basically determines which direction the bias is. I give this story every time I teach my valuation class. If you've heard this story before, you're going to hear it one more time. I tell them about a company called Lynn Cable. And this is about 20 years ago. And it was a time when AT&T had this option to buy, it was a, ca it was a cable company, obviously, and this option to buy 49% of Lynn Cable at an appraised value. So that's where the option was written. So the time for the option to be exercised comes about. AT&T hires Morgan Stanley. So you guys are going to be Morgan Stanley, right? Maybe you already work for Morgan Stanley, but if you know. So you, and your job is to assess the value of the 49% so that AT&T can buy that, so you work for the buyer. Lynn Broadcasting hired Lehman Brothers. I'm sorry to do this to you, but think of yourself <laughs> as pre-bankrupt Lehman Brothers. But your job is to assess the value of the same 49% so that Lynn can, so you work for the seller, you work for the buyer. Two investment banking teams go to work. Grind through the numbers, come up with models. You know. They come back with two very different numbers. One side comes back with $105 per share. The other comes back with $155 per share. Now, who do you think came back with $105 per share? Why? Because you worked for the buyer. You did your job. You came into the low ball number. You did your job. You came into the high ball number. In fact, the numbers were so different, they decided to call in a third investment banker. Why set up for two fees when you can have three, I guess? <laughs> and they call in Wasserstein Perella. And I'm going to say something incredibly harsh about these guys, but I mean every word of it. These guys couldn't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag <laughs> if you put it in front of them. They'd invent some multiple that nobody had seen before. Enterprise value to cash in the bank, 3.3. <laughs> before you know it, you'd be paying $66 for a $20 bill. But if you're Wasserstein Perella, you're right in the middle, right? You don't want to piss off either side too much. So 105, 155. Where's the safest place for you to be? 130, right? They came back with $127.50. <laughs> I'm going to let you in on a little secret in valuation. Don't let it out of this room. If you're ever asked to value something, never, ever come back with a nice round number. <laughs> Don't tell me the target price is 40. Tell me it's $38.87. It's amazing what that second decimal will do in terms of creating an illusion. You actually know what you're doing. When in doubt, add decimals. 
the intimidation factor is amazing. Excel, you can go 10 decimals, 15, 20, 25. Just keep doing it. At some point, people step back and say, I'm not asking this guy questions. He's got the 25th decimal point nailed down. Okay? And if you're on the other side of the table, remember this. When you see more decimals, what's the guy doing? He's basically trying to intimidate you. Okay, so round it up. Round it to the nearest billion. Might as well, right? So, yeah. so bias comes from lots of different places, but there is bias. Now, I'm not even going to go through this page. I have this weakness of trying to fit as much as I can into a single page. My objective in life actually is to take my entire class and see if I can fit into one slide. <laughs> one of these days, I'm going to be able to pull it off. But if you're doing valuation, keep this page. This is my template for how you can introduce bias into your valuations. And there are actually ways you can introduce. In, one of the ways you can separate people who know how to do valuation from people who don't is you know how to do valuation, you can hide your bias better. If you don't know how to do valuation, your bias is obvious. You do stupid things like assume a 6% growth in perpetuity. Okay? There are ways of hiding bias. So if you get a chance, go through this. This is my template for building bias into valuation, but it's also a template you can use to detect bias when you have it in valuations. So let's talk some numbers. Some of them, and I was asked to talk about Facebook, so I might as well talk about Facebook. Facebook's been this, one of the two stories of the year, right? One is Apple, the other was Facebook. So this was on May 17th of 2012, the day before the IPO. Now, I've always believed that if you're going to do valuation, you have to throw the numbers out there. I've never believed on the one hand and the other hand hedging. So basically, I said, I'm going to do a valuation. I'm going to throw it out there. Could I be wrong? Of course. What percent of the time? 100 percent of the time. But one of the nice things about doing valuation is it's OK to be wrong. Because all you have to do is be less wrong than the next guy. And they all screw up so much. Hey, I'm OK with this. So the day before the IPO, and as you know, at 4 PM that day, the IPO price, the offering price was set at 38. I did a valuation of Facebook. So this is my valuation the day before. And I posted my blog saying, I know that Morgan Stanley has access to far more information than I do. And I'm sure they have a really good basis for pricing Facebook. And I was very clear that they were pricing Facebook, not valuing Facebook. This is my estimate of value. And the value that I came up with is $25. Did I make assumptions? God, did I make assumptions. Every number there is an assumption. Revenue growth, margins, et cetera. Now, to show you, though, how much that value is a function of assumptions, I'm going to show you two more valuations. Just if, you, if I'd been working at Morgan Stanley, thank God I wasn't, but you know, if I had, and my job had been to justify the $38 price, I could have tweaked this valuation, and you wouldn't even have noticed me tweaking it. I, and, the, and I've kind of listed my big assumptions. It basically boils down to the fact that I made a small change in my assumptions about margins over time, and I made a small change in my assumptions about return on capital and perpetuity. And if you don't get the nitty gritty of valuation, probably don't even notice those changes happening in the background. And with those two changes made, the value per share that I get is $39.32 there. You can justify the $38 price. Now, if you'd come to me with a different agenda and said, I'd like to sell short on Facebook. I want a $15 value. No problem. <laughs> Again, with a little tweaking, I can come up with $14. What I'm trying to say is, if you have a valuation model, and you have real bias, there are ways in which you can make that model sing the tune you want it to sing. It's buyer beware. So if you're on the other side of the table, you can be intimidated by this big model, but you want to focus in on the big drivers of value. And if you focus on the big drivers, you can sometimes, if you're lucky, spot that bias when it shows up in your valuations. So let's, let's, let's talk about the other way in which people do valuation, which is pricing. Okay, there are three steps to pricing. You start and you pick a multiple, right? Which one? Whichever one works for you. We act as if multiples come from heaven. They're not. You as an analyst decide whether to use PE ratios, EV to EBITDA, EV to sales, EV to invested capital, whatever. So here's my job. If I'm an analyst valuing a company and I have to come up with a number, I try seven multiples. I come up with seven different values. Which one am I going to use? Whichever helps me tell my story. Second step in the process, I have to pick comparables. 
I have to decide what I mean by comparable. Am I going to look globally, just locally? Am I going to define it narrowly by sector or broadly by, by business? So essentially, I get to decide what multiple to use. I decide to pick the comparables to use. If you let me pick the multiple and you let me choose the comparables, you've ceded the entire battleground to me. Because I'm going to find a way to justify whatever number I want. You think real estate in Mumbai is expensive? All I need to do is compare to real estate in, in Tokyo. Okay? Just find something even more overpriced and say, you know what, that's cheap. You let me pick the multiple and you let me pick the comparables. You've essentially let me decide what the final number is. So be a shit disturber. When somebody uses EV to EBITDA, I say, well, that's nice. Well, try EV to book. In other words, you want to get them off the game because if you let them set the, set the rules of the game, you've lost control of the process. If they show you 15 companies, they say, those are my comparables, ask, did you start with 15 or did you start with 25? They're going to lie and say, I started with 15. So don't lie to me. Show me the 10 companies you threw out, not the 15 companies you left in because that's going to tell me a lot more about your valuation than just what you see in the output. So it's, it's again part of the process and something to think about whenever you think about looking at somebody else's valuation. So let's talk about dealing with bias. Here the, uh, uh, there, there are unhealthy ways of doing this and healthy ways of doing it. Here are the unhealthy ways. The first is the analyst says, look, I'm not biased. I use only numbers, as if that's a defense against being biased. In fact, this has become the base for anybody doing valuation. I'm not biased. Look, it's all numbers. They came out of the accounting statements. It can be all numbers and still be biased. You saw my Facebook valuation. They were all numbers, all three valuations, but values ranging from $14 all the way to $39. The second is, for some reason, I've gotten roped into doing these talks at CFA. These acronyms gone crazy, all these valuation <laughs> certificates. Every one of them has this professional statement that says, our professional thing is we are, we are going to be unbiased. As of putting that down on paper will make you unbiased. If it were only that simple. And the third, and this is, I think, a game we've seen played is, I've got this fairness opinion signed off. Who the heck cares? You know, there's a fairness opinion for the worst deals done in history. The Time Warner AOL deal, there is a fairness opinion somewhere in somebody's water saying that's fair. Yeah? It doesn't matter. See, it's not even, it, do, it doesn't even matter because I think it basically reflects the fact that fairness here means nothing. Okay? In fact, um, I was asked to talk to a group of CPAs. Why was I asked to do that? Maybe to torture me or something. Uh, the CPA call, they, and they were the rule writers. And they wanted me to talk about fair value accounting. And I put up my first slide, and they knew where I was coming from. I said, fair value accounting, oxymoron. Make up your mind. Do you want to do valuation? Do you want to do accounting? Don't do both, because you do neither. Okay? Because the notion of fair value in the hands of accountants is a little meaningless. Because you can know, write all the rules you want, but there's this bias that, that feeds into the process. It's a make work for accountants. You know, that's basically what it is, because if you need a fair value accounting, they need to revisit you every year to fair value everything you have. That's a lot of money to be made. Okay? So that's the first issue is, is with bias. A lot of people deny it. They just act like it's not there. So here's what I'd propose. I don't think there's, a, there's much chance of it happening in the short term, is we need to start thinking about building processes where there's less bias. There's no way you can build a process with no bias. It's impossible to do less bias over more bias. Let me give you a couple examples. Equity research is going to be biased. The way it's structured is you have an analyst who tracks 15 companies for the rest of his life. You can ask him to be honest about these companies because if he's honest about these companies, they're going to cut him off. That's the rest of his life. The nature of the process is an equity research analyst cannot afford to be unbiased because of the way we've structured this process. m and of course it's going to be biased. Because what I'm asking, I'm going to the deal maker and ask him, does this deal make sense? The analogy I use is like asking a plastic surgeon, is there something wrong with my face? <laughs> what, do you, what do you expect to hear? You're perfect? I mean, if he says you're perfect, he has nothing to do, right? You go to a deal maker and say, does this deal make sense? He has one or two answers he can give you. He can give you the honest answer, say, 
do not do this deal, it is a terrible deal, in which case what does he get? The undying gratitude of my stockholders, but try paying bonuses with that. <laughs> or you can say the deal makes sense, in which case it is 50 million, 100 million, 150. The, the process is skewed towards saying yes on the deal. So we need to start thinking about processes, because until we fix the processes, the valuations are not going to get fixed. Second, let us be honest at least with ourselves. Do not put it down on paper, you could get sued, subpoenaed, whatever. But be honest, maybe implicitly when you're late at night with just your spouse, maybe not even with your spouse around, because who knows what, you know, she might be a witness for the prosecution or something in this case. <laughs> so maybe when you're in the bathroom, look in the mirror and say, today, I made up some numbers. <laughs> I don't think Facebook is really worth $38. I will tell nobody but myself, right? So, but let's stop lying to ourselves about this. Hey, I'm honest. I'm objective. I'm just saying that, not telling the truth as I see it. Okay? In fact, in statistics, there's a branch of statistics called Bayesian statistics, where you're supposed to state your priors before you tell me what you know. So you run an experiment. Tell me what you thought you were going to find before you run the experiment. Maybe we should have a similar practice in equity research. The analyst says up front, "I really love this company. Now let me show, go through the numbers and see if, in fact, I can show you my love." Okay. It's, it's, it'll be good to know where people come from. But as I said, it might be easy to do that if you know which direction the bias comes from. Okay. And be transparent about your motives. So uh, I can't force you to be honest, but I can at least learn about what your, you know, what axis you have to grind. Because that will allow me, as a person using your valuation, to decide how much I will trust your valuation. talk about uncertainty. If you think about valuation, you think about all these inputs, okay? you know, cash flows, growth rates, and every one of the inputs, you face uncertainty. So if you, if, if the, generically, I think about four basic questions I need to answer the value of company. What are the cash flows you get from existing assets? What is the value that you're going to create from growth in the future? Don't notice the, how I frame that question. I didn't ask, what's your growth rate going to be in the future, but what value you create from that growth rate? How risky are you as a business? And when will you be a mature company? All of the inputs in valuation basically boil down to those four inputs. And every single one of those inputs you estimate with uncertainty. But not every company is equally difficult to value, right? In fact, now I'm going to show you three valuations. The first was a valuation of 3M. Companies have been around a long, long time. Just boring stuff, but boring, very profitable stuff. Like that post-it pad. That was a stroke of genius, right? The guy who invented that should get a Nobel Prize. Because think of how many people use it. Okay? But it's an incredibly private. It's a company that's been around a long time. You know exactly what it does. Its margins are stable. It does pretty much the same thing. And this was the valuation in the good old days, when developed markets were developed markets and emerging markets were emerging markets. Every market now is an emerging market, so those good old days are pretty much gone. Okay? So this is the valuation in 2007. We were valuing a stable company in a in a fairly stable economy. So I did the valuation, the number. It's true I made estimates, but I felt with each estimate, if you think about a margin for error, I felt pretty comfortable. The distribution on the inputs was much tighter. The value that I got was $83. The stock was trading at 70. But I mean, the, I, that's not what I'm going to focus on. Here's a second valuation. Valuation of Tata Motors in 2010. A company that, that, that has history, you can see what's happening. But couple of things are kind of ro rocking the boat here. One is that in the year prior to this valuation, you had two big changes. One was the internal investment in the nano kind of changing the mix. And the other was the acquisition of Jaguar Land Rover, which is changing the mix as well, in an economy which has so more macro uncertainty associated with it. More uncertainty here, because again, a combination of what the company had done in the near past and what the economy was doing. And the third valuation I'm going to show you is a valuation of Amazon in early 2000 that I've flogged to death over time. Because in a sense, it's the valuation in January 2000, for those of you who don't remember, was when the NASDAQ at 5,000, the peak of the dot-com boom, tremendous uncertainty about the future, about the company, not so much about the economy. What, I was, what I'm trying to highlight with all three valuations is when you think about uncertainty in valuation, it comes from lots of different places. It can be estimation uncertainty or economic uncertainty. People mix up the two. Estimation uncertainty is mistakes you're making in estimation. Economic uncertainty comes from the outside. And the reason I emphasize that 
is there is this illusion that if you spend more time doing valuation, you can make uncertainty go away. I will give you an experiment. Try valuing a Greek company. You can spend from now through eternity refining your valuation and guess what? You are still going to face uncertainty. Some uncertainty, economic uncertainty, you can't make go away by building bigger models. So, it is estimation uncertainty versus economic. There is micro uncertainty versus macro uncertainty. What am I talking about? With Amazon, there is a lot of micro uncertainty, right? I do not know what the margins will be, what markets are going to sell, what the revenues will be, the cash flows will be. With Tata Motors, there is a lot of macro uncertainty. You think, so what? Again, the way you deal with it is very different. Micro uncertainties you try to refine through your cash flows, macro uncertainties you try to capture in your discount rate. And there is discrete uncertainty versus discontinuous uncertainty. What, I, what am I talking about? Let's say you value Venezuelan company or a Russian company. You do all the standard stuff, right? You project the cash flows, you discount them, you come up with the value. And then I say, oh, by the way, you might have forgotten something very important. If your company looks really, really, really good, what might happen? Hugo Chavez on his deathbed might say, hey, I've nationalized the company. That's uncertainty. It's, it's a very different kind of uncertainty. The, the uncertainties we're very good at dealing with in valuation tend to be you know, continuous uncertainties, basically that happen all the time. That's what you build through the discount rate. Discrete uncertainties, where you could basically you could either go bankrupt or you can't. You get nationalized, you don't, are much more difficult to deal with. So one thing I would suggest when you do valuation and you find yourself faced with uncertainty, step back and think about what type of uncertainty is bothering you. Because the way you respond is going to be different depending on the uncertainty. Okay. So let me make some suggestions on uncertainty. Okay. So if you look at the four valuations we've seen, you can see that all of them reflect uncertainty. But I'd probably feel more certain about the 3M valuation in 2007 than I would about the Facebook or the Amazon valuations or the Tata Motors value. So if you think about uncertainty, not all companies are equally difficult or easy to value. So if I ask you to pick a company to value, which would you rather value, 3M or Facebook? But be careful. Why do we do valuation? Because we want to make money off those valuations, right? So you pick a company that's easy to value. Congratulations, you're going to be done. ExxonMobil, anybody can value ExxonMobil, including my 14-year-old. It's not a difficult company to value. The payoff to doing valuation is not how uncertain you are about the value of a company, but how uncertain you are about a value of a company relative to other people valuing the company. And here's one of the big ironies in valuation. The payoff to doing valuation is greatest with companies we feel more, most uncertain about the future. The payoff to doing valuation is greater when there's a lot of macro uncertainty than when there isn't. Because after every crisis, I get asked this question. Does it make sense to actually do valuation in a market like this one? And I say it's exactly in a market like this one that you should do valuation because most people give up. Okay. So here are unhealthy ways of dealing with uncertainty. They're human nature, right? First thing is what uncertainty? I don't see any uncertainty. An analogy I would give is you're driving down a highway, your GPS has failed, you come to a fork in the road, you're not sure which way to go. I know what I'll do, I'll just stop. Paralyze. I don't know what to do now. Or you can say, I always go right. I don't know why, but always go right. That's mental accounting. You're basically using a rule that has no basis in reality. You just make up these rules. Or you turn to your wife and say, which way should we go? <laughs> that way you can blame her. That's outsourcing the uncertainty, right? I mean, in other words, we don't deal with uncertainty in any healthy way. It's not like any of these actions are going to make it a better choice, but we do it all the time, and people do that in valuation. So I won't get a chance to go through this, but about um, my, the presentation for this is on my website. I actually at the AIMR conference about two months ago talked about 10 things you can do to deal with uncertainty. And I'll very quickly list them so you can at least think about healthy ways to bring in uncertainty. First, remember, when faced with uncertainty, less is more. When I value difficult to value companies, the number of line items I estimate gets smaller rather than larger. It goes against human tendency, which is to add more detail when you feel uncertain. Have less detail. Aggregate. Don't disaggregate. Build an internal checks within your own valuation. In other words, make sure your valuation is not at war with itself. Okay? Third, 
when you make assumptions about something, make sure there's something offsetting it. So for instance, if you think inflation is going to be low, that's going to help you on your interest rate and your discount rate, but it's also going to hurt you when you talk about growth. So if you have offsetting effects, it has a much lesser impact on valuation. Draw on first principles. You can't make up rules as you go along. So if you tell me your company is going to have an 80% return on capital forever, I have a problem with that. Because that's really not an estimation issue. It's a question of, has any company ever been able to pull that off? What kind of competitive advantage is this that you have that allows you to do it? I use the market as a crutch all the time. Because even if I think markets make mistakes, the one thing I cannot afford to do is ignore what markets are telling me. So even if you have very little respect for the market price, you think investors are crazy, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a method to, the, to that madness. There's something you can always extract. So when I you know one of the key inputs in valuation is an equity risk premium. And if I ask you where you're getting your equity risk premium, the answer I get is you've outsourced it, right? You looked it up on Ibbotson, you looked it up on my website, you blame me, the motor and got it wrong, it's not my problem. But there is an implied equity risk premium in the market. You can back it out of the market and you can use it. So use the data in the market when you're faced with uncertainty as a way of kind of getting over it. Use a lot of large numbers. Bears me out every single time. What am I talking about? When I have to estimate the margin for a company, I can look at their margins last year. That's one, one point. Or I can look at their average margins over time, the average margins across the sector. Averaging might seem like a simplistic thing to do, but it's amazing how much power there is to the law of large numbers. Yesterday, I finished my update for the 2012 data sets. And at the start of every year, I update my data. And one of the reasons I compute these averages, not because I'm a Mother Teresa who wants to give away the data, but those are the numbers I'll be using for the rest of the year when I'm doing valuation. So if you ask me to value a steel company, I can look at its existing margin, but I'm always going to measure it up against what the rest of the sector is going to look like, what those averages look like. Don't let the discount rate become the receptacle for everything that's scaring you. There's a temptation there to go push up the discount rate. I'm scared. I'm going to push it up. Okay? It's not a device meant for everything that you're afraid of. So don't let it be the places I'm, there's liquidity, so let me push that discount rate up. When you're faced with uncertainty, don't avoid it. Okay? What I'm talking about is there are tools and techniques out there for bringing uncertainty into valuations. I use crystal ball. Do any of you use crystal ball in your value? No? It's, it's great looking output. Even if it's garbage in, garbage out, you can turn out some really good looking garbage. Okay? But basically, if you use it right, though, what does crystal ball allow you to do? It allows you to introduce uncertainty about your inputs, right? So when I ask you what the revenue growth rate is, rather than give me a number, you give me a distribution, which is reality. 25 years ago, I'd have had to pay somebody tens of thousands of dollars to run simulations for me. Now, with a few hundred dollars, you can install it on your laptop, run it off Excel, and you're there. And finally, don't look for precision. As I said, you're going to be wrong 100% of the time. So what? Be ready to be, I mean, the key is you're going to make mistakes. If you say, I want a model that doesn't make mistakes, you're never going to do valuations. So if you get a chance, kind of go through those pages. You're, you're getting these pages I go through, right, basically? No. Actually, I, I have to tell you that I just, um, the, the page that's in your slides is June 2012. The June two, uh, January 2013 country risk premiums are up. This is the most up, most downloaded data set on my website. It gets used in the strangest places. I get emails from places. I, I remember getting an email from the New Zealand Milk Board saying, um, we're using your country risk premiums to set prices for New Zealand farmers. I was like, why? No, I don't know. Who are they selling to? Uh, China? I don't know. Maybe that's what they were doing. You know? And usually they say, well, how do you come up with these numbers? And I have a little PDF file on it because there's no rocket science here. But I do get some emails that are a little way over the top. I'll give you my favorite, or least favorite of all time. About two years ago, in 2009, I get an email from a business person in Lebanon. I'm very excited to get an email about valuation in the Middle East. I don't get that many questions. So I open up the email, and this is how it begins. You have destroyed Lebanon. I said, what? <laughs> how the heck did I do that? Yeah, I can see myself destroying Liechtenstein or Luxembourg, or one of those quasi-European countries. But Lebanon, after 25 years of civil war, I'm the guy who destroyed this? So I keep reading. What did I do? So it turns out that he was a Lebanese business person whose business had been appraised for value. And his appraiser had pulled the risk premium from my website <laughs> to value the company. And if you look at Lebanon, it's right there. Right now, it's 12%. But that was 14.5% in 2009. 
You see why this guy was really pissed off. You build in a 14.5% risk premium, you have a high discount rate, you have a high discount rate, you have a low value. So this guy thought he got gypped on his valuation, it was all my fault. My first response was, not my problem, take it up with your appraiser. And then I remembered the email was from Lebanon. <laughs> and I decided that discretion was the better part of valor here. So I look for somebody else to blame. You know how I get these premiums? What do I start with? I start with the sovereign rating for the country. Why? There's no way I can do research on these countries to figure out how risk. So first mistake I make is I trust the ratings agencies, right? But it's cheap. It's free, actually. So I said, it's not my fault. It's Moody's fault. <laughs> and by the way, if you want their address, here it is. Put it into your GPS. Park your car over there. Okay? <laughs> Don't do anything near my building. I have nothing to do with this. Eh? So if you get a chance, kind of go through these risk premiums, but there's no intellectual firepower behind any of these numbers. Don't do anything rash with them. Right? I'm pretty much running out of time. So let me go to the last part of valuation. Oh, there's that nice looking output I talked about. Eh? The only thing about, about, Mont about these simulations is before you do it, I know you those of, those of you took, I mean, you took your statistics class, and I know you sold that book back the minute the class ended and said, thank God this class is over. I don't have to ever look at this book again. Go and buy it back. Because the skill set that I see most lacking in valuation is basic statistics. Okay, so if you're going to use crystal ball, at least get a sense of what the difference is between the distributions. Because if you don't, guess which distribution you end up using for everything? What's the only distribution we have any connection to after we leave that statistics class? Normal. I'm normal, so I'll just pick the normal distribution, right? <laughs> nothing is exponential, nothing is uniform, everything is normal. Okay? So at least do that homework on different distributions because there is this incredible payoff you will get, which is you can then take your uncertainty, face up to it, put it in there, and let the output reflect what you find. So in the Facebook valuation, for instance, in addition to doing my valuation, I said, you know what? I could be wrong. This is how wrong I could be. Here's the distribution. Is there a chance that $38 is a fair price? Absolutely. There's a 31% chance it's, it, you could buy the stock and it'd still be cheap. Okay. I, could, I should say 31.535%. The, the third decimal point again creates a delusion that I'm actually talking about something that's more precise than it actually is. But deal with it. Yeah. Which brings me to the last piece in valuation. When you look at complexity in valuation, some of it is coming from the outside. Companies are getting more complex. They're multinationals, multi I call these companies octopuses. Basically, they have you know, tentacles all over the place, making them more difficult to value. Data is getting more accessible. That's a good thing, right? But it's also making valuations more complex. Capital IQ, you can get 350 line items about every company on the face of the earth. You wouldn't have, you know, 25 years ago, you were digging through an annual report looking for those numbers that kind of constrain how much data you could use. And you can build bigger and better models so much more easily than you used to be able to. So that's all feeding into making models more complex. You also have complexity fed from below. Analysts sometimes build complexity because it intimidates. And if your objective in doing evaluation is to make sure nobody has any idea what's going on, you build a more complex model. And you're also getting complexity coming from legal you know, accounting. So all of this is feeding into making models bigger. Okay. I'm going to stop with this slide, but I'm going to talk about the complexity and what it does. First, it does two things. One is it creates input fatigue. Not input fatigue is? I'll describe it. And those of you who do valuation will probably relate very quickly to it. It'll hit you around 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. You've been working all week. In fact, you've been, you're working through 11 o'clock on Saturday. You're exhausted. You get ready to turn off your computer to go home. Your managing director comes in and throws a 10K on your desk. So I want this company valued on my desk first thing tomorrow morning. Why? Sunday morning. It's his trial by fire. He wants to see how much you really want this job. Now, part of you wants to exercise your option to abandon. I won't describe it, but it's a deeply satisfying option to exercise, but then there are deeply dissatisfying moments that follow. It usually takes the form of the 10K and throwing it back in his face, saying, do it yourself. That's a deeply satisfying moment, but then everything after that is downhill. So you think about it, then you hold back. You remember your car payment, your house, and all that stuff, and then you decide to do the valuation. So you sit there starting entering the numbers. You have this model that's being built by this in-house team. And God help you, if there's a team in-house that builds models for you, it's Geek City, right? 
you hire people, they go, always go into the basement for some reason. They don't see the light. They're like vampires. Okay? They love building models and macros on top of macros and bigger and bigger mo the model. Inputs come and they never leave. So the model starts with 10, then 15, 30, 50, 80, 85 inputs to value one company. So you sit down, you start entering the numbers, you get to the 10th input. The clock strikes midnight. You're not Cinderella. You wish you were. Then you look down, there are 75 more inputs to go, your stomach drops. Then you look at the 11th input, says, what was the inventory five years ago? Part of you wants to get up and look it up, but that part's too exhausted to get out of the chair. The other part prompts, enter a random number, let's move on. And it's amazing how quickly they all roll out, right? Then the scary thing is when the output comes out, it all looks the same. That input you toiled hours over, random numbers all melt together. That's input fatigue. The other is the model becomes a black box. I still remember a conversation I had with an equity research analyst uh, from JP Morgan, I think, about 20 years ago, about a company had a buy recommendation on. It's a company I was familiar with. It had a target price of 85. I said, how did you come up with such a high value? What do you like about the company? He said, I didn't do it. I said, what do you mean you didn't do it? Your, company, your name's on the report. It says $85. He said, I didn't do it. I said, who did it? He said, Value Mac did it. I said, who the heck is Value Mac? He says, that's our in-house valuation model. I said, what did you do, sneak into your office in the middle of the night, value the company, and leave it on your desk? But you know what he was trying to say. Look, I fed the numbers into this model. Something happened there. $85 popped out. In fact, look for these words in any valuation report. If it says, the model valued the company at. You know what the analyst is saying, right? He says, saying, don't blame me. I just work for the model. It asked me for inputs, I feed it in. It asked me to go get a cup of coffee, I come back, it's left a valuation on my desk. Okay? Models don't value companies, you and I do. And I think when you think about complexity, the healthiest thing to do is kind of strip complexity away. It, it goes counter because we're to build bigger models, use more data, less is more. I've never done a valuation with more than eight line items, ever. I've never ever broken down working capital into you know how you can break your working time, inventory. If you can predict accounts receivable in the year 2030, all the more power to you. I have no chance of doing it. Why even try? So keep it simple because, as I said, when you think about valuation, those are the three things that get in the way of good valuation. Bias, uncertainty, and complexity. And if you can learn to handle them, the rest is just mechanics. So that's about it. So let me um, uh, let me introduce the panel that's, that we're going to talk about valuation. So thank you.